late today. I had to do some updates. Had a client call go long. Uh, had a question from someone self-described as one of my fans uh, asking about uh, whether or not Entity Framework Core has fixed the issue that it used to have with the uh, in-memory identity keys not being sequential and that they would uh, step on each other in unit tests. So I seem to recall I have a repository somewhere that uh, demonstrated that issue. I'm going to see if it goes away in 3.0. Um, so first first order of business is going to be to find that repo. Um, the other thing I wanted to point out for uh, anybody, there's nobody here yet, so I guess it'll be for the YouTube viewers later. Um, if you watched my .NET Conf presentation a couple days ago, I uh, talked about eShop on web, and the slides for that, a bunch of people were asking for them. Um, they're here, and you know they covered a bunch of stuff on uh, clean architecture and books and some other things. Um, I have made the slides available uh, on the .NET Conf 2019 repo. So if you go out to this uh, .NET presentations, .NET Conf 2019, um, it's there, and or it will be there. It's, my pull request is still pending. Um, but if you go to my branch, which is uh, the Sardalis one here, it's already there. So there's a link to that. Um, and it's under technical, and it's the tour of Microsoft Reference ASP.NET Core app is the name of that. So look for that. Uh, it's got my name on it, Steve Smith. All right. Um, so let's go back to me. Let's see if we can find that EF Core repo that I think I made. And hopefully I named it well. Let's see. We talk about owned entities. See if that's changed at all. Maybe we'll look at that if we have time. We can get back into the specification. Um, hmm. And if I don't have an example of it, we'll just code one up real quick. Let's see. Maybe I called it Entity Framework. Owned entities. That's just a fork. Looks the same. All right, where's that uh, issue? Let's see. Our Dallas EF core in memory Ide identity ID. This looks like the right one. And that next one as well. Hey, there we go. So here's my repo steps. All right. Boom. 35 people have upvoted that. Uh, let's let's see what that looks like now. So. Probably I've got that in a project somewhere, but I guess we'll just create a new one. So let's uh, let's create a new Visual Studio. We'll create a new test project. So let's uh, create a new project. What was this using? Probably XUnit. Yeah. So we want an XUnit test project that's VB All right. and this will be EF core tests I guess I don't have a better name for that and we may as well put this out on github right so just so it's out there so we'll create a new repo EF core uh, what kind of things can we test um, your tests. How about that? That's a little better. Uh, tests demonstrating EF core features across versions. That will be public. We'll give it a readme. We'll have it do the Visual Studio ignore. We'll give it away to anybody that wants it and we'll create a repository. Now that we have a repository, we will copy that. Go to PowerShell. CD back, CD dev, CD GitHub, git clone that, and we'll create our project there. C colon. There we go, and I already forgot what I called it. EF core feature or something. Feature tests. And 
Sure, it's only gonna have one project. We'll call this the same thing. Let's create that. Hey, we got one person that showed up. All right. A couple now, excellent. All right, so let's see. I've got uh, my code that I want is over here. Test fails, it should pass. All right, so I've got basically this code that I want. And drop that in here. And we need to add, let's first of all see, are we on? We're on three. Okay, good. And we want to add a NuGet package for EF core in memory. install that and we accept the license okay let's go back here you have core um, all right shouldn't matter. I guess we'll build and see if that gets rid of the red. Mm -hmm. Oh, because it's so old. That's why this thing takes a name now and has for a long time. That issue's been out there since EF Core 1 something. Um, what am I doing with this? I want this to be a new every time, just to be sure it's unique. So we'll say system dot guid dot new guid dot two string. Now it'll give us a new name every time. And we're gonna need link for that. All right, now let's review this uh, this test and see what it's doing. Since all I've done is copy it from. So we have an item, which has an ID and a name. AppDB context has a DB set of items, pretty standard. Our tests have a DB context options that will create a service provider, which uses identity entity framework in memory. And hey, Smab UK, how's it going? Um, and we're going to build it with our DB context options. Uh, and we can pass that into our new app DB context for every test. When we create a test, we can add an item and save changes, verify that its ID is one, delete it, and then verify there aren't any. Create another item and add it, and we think the ID should still be one. Why would the ID? Why would the ID still be one there? That's weird. I might have to read my reasoning. In a database, it would be with an identity column. It would probably not be one, right? Because the identity would have increased, even though we deleted this. Oh, I see. We deleted the database. There we go. So since I deleted the entire database, and now I'm creating a new database, this, uh, we should start from fresh, and this should be a new one. All right, so let's see what this does. This could be much ado about nothing if this just works. You're very small today. Sorry to hear that. Um, right, so our test fails. And our test failed because, because instance of their identity conflict 
Another instance with the same value for ideas already being tracked. Alright, what line is this that we failed on? So the identity map fails. Line 60. So we try and add item 2, which we just newed up. It doesn't even have an ID yet, and you're going to blow up on me? Really? That's weird. I don't, like, set the ID to anything, do I? No, it's just a get set here. Alright, that's not necessarily what I was hoping for. Let's, let's go back here. So this is way back in the Project JSON days of uh, Netcore App 1. And... Do, do, it says it's a duplicate of that. This is back when Rowan Miller was still on the team. He's since moved on and is doing other cool stuff. Vickers gave us this code three years ago to reset the value generators. And some people like that. But then we said, hey, maybe we could consider doing this. And Diego came on the scene three years ago. And uh, value generator has not reset. Alright, so this got this is a bug that got closed. Thirty-three more things. All right, so here we're talking about it again. Less than a year ago, does not work for test running in parallel. Right, ID of course will be set to zero by default. Uh, I'm sure that's the issue, but there's no reason that should cause that error. That doesn't make any sense because then you'd never be able to add a new instance of an of an item. That would be crazy talk. Um, I think it just doesn't like the fact that I built nuke the database out from under it in the middle of my test, so I probably need to change how I'm structuring my test. But let me continue getting through this and see what the current state of things is supposed to be. So Vicar says to see this earlier this year, and there's a whole bunch of other stuff. Um, Self-assign this, merged in, associate in-memory integer value generation with the property. All right. This thing gets... That's another one. So that testing issue one is associated. We're running parallel tests. Yeah, all these things are closed now as of April. So preview four, perhaps this thing came out. AJ got a little snippy with somebody here saying, because I changed the state to closed, it, you can assume it's closed and fixed. And because I made the milestone preview 4, it was in preview 4. Right. Well done. Alright. Does not still work with test running in parallel, though, uh, which is a problem. So, here's an example of building custom with Autofac. Makes it easy to set this up. What should I do? File a new issue. Alright. Um, mm -hmm. Alright. So, let me go check out what my test is doing compared to what some of these tests are doing. So, this test says I'm going to go get my in memory database. I'm going to add the value generator cache thing, get rid of the basic one that was there. I don't see how this is running anything in parallel. Okay, I don't think he's showing the parallel run. Alright, let's jump back up here to the top. Let's see what these other ones say. Got it. Alright, so... Here says error, and with the key has already been added. Steps to reproduce. He's going to use a console app, in memory database, create a DB context, create another DB context, add the same entity twice, or add a new instance of it to each of these, and you get an exception here. Why would you get an exception here? It's kind of the same behavior I'm seeing. Create DB context.
use in memory database that name. So he's using the same name for both of them. That's why these are the same database, even though he created two DB contacts. And yeah, okay. This doesn't throw an exception. What's the difference? It's using the same name there too. Use on 2.1, this will get fixed. To associate the generated value state with the database, right, because right now there's no association. Okay. Their keys, their identity keys are per type, but not per database. All right, in memory is not enforcing foreign keys, not refreshing, not support transactions, not resetting auto incremented, that's the one. So this is the one that we're trying to look at. And theoretically, 6872 fixes it. Let's look at that. Maybe it provides a, a way to show. Okay, this is the one we already looked at. So he's basically implemented this in there. Is that what he did? Why am I getting sent here? Do I still have to do this myself or? All right, let's see what this does. So we'll take this and this, bring it over into my code, and just throw it in here at the top. My expectation was that whatever fix they had done was one that didn't require me to add any code. So maybe I'm wrong. What are JetBrains annotations? I don't have any JetBrains stuff. Now that looks good. All right, let's see what they said to do. It says, make sure you call this anytime you call ensure deleted, which I am doing in my test. So let's come back here and weigh down at the bottom. I call ensure deleted. He says, call this right above it, like that, and let's run the test. It's still red. Fail, tell me why. Instance. No, make this easier to read. Type cannot be tracked. It's already being tracked. Same error. One attaching. Consider enable sensitive data logging and see the conflicting key values. Alright, I know it's gonna be a key value of zero because I'm newing the thing up. But I don't know if that's the same error I was gonna get in a previous version. What if I use 2.2? Do I get a different error? Let's see. Hey Khaled, I'm trying to verify if they fixed the issue with in-memory key generation. And I have uh, this issue, 6872, which I've actually opened up twice here. 
I'll throw it in the chat for you, um, that describes the issue from 2016, from 35 months ago, there was this issue. And the issue is that you should be able to delete and recreate and reseed an in-memory database, and that database should be a brand new consistent state anytime you reset it like that. Right? You should be able to, it shouldn't matter if you've done anything previously with in-memory data uh, from that point, right? So your test should run the same. And that was not the case, right? So let me see uh, 226. Looks like a good one to use. So let's see what, if I got a different error in 226. Um, and so far, I can't get this test to work because here's what my test is doing. And this is a copy of the test that's from that issue. All right, I created DB context. It's using in memory, which is all right here. So add in memory database, use in memory database, use this service provider. I'm actually being sure I'm using an entirely different DB context each time. Uh, in this case, it doesn't matter because I only knew it up once, but. Um, it can make a difference when you're doing tests with EF that you want to make sure each test gets a new, completely new version of, of an AppDB context. Okay, so we add an item and we save the changes. Now what should happen there? It's in memory. So it should generate a key for item and that key should be one, right? So here we're going to assert that that's the case. And you know, while we're at it, let's, let's go ahead and just debug through this thing. So we'll come up here, let's debug. Show me my locals. All right, there's an item one, there's an item two. We'll step, step, create the item. All right, so there's item one. Guess what its ID is gonna be? Oh, it's zero, what a surprise. All right, so we add it. Now it's added uh, to the items collection. And even before we save changes, notice this, its ID is now set to one. Um, so just the act of adding it to the items collection changes the item which is not how it works if it's a SQL provider, mind you. If I do the same thing, and I wasn't using an in-memory database, I was using a SQL provider, its ID would not have been set yet. Now I save changes. Save changes really doesn't do anything for an in-memory provider. Right? It's already there, it's already in a list, it's already in memory. Um, but now I can verify that its ID is one, right? that works. I'm gonna reset my value generator and delete my database. So database is gone. Um, so now my DB context, when I go to talk to it, it should have a new instance of its database. So there shouldn't be any items in the DB context, right? So we assert that this is false, that there is any items, right? So it's like assert that the DB context has zero items in it. All right, now we're going to create a new instance of item. All right, let's do that. All right, it's obviously different from item one, all right? It's a, it's a whole different instance over here. And it's not null, its ID is zero. Zero is not being tracked, right? Now we add it, and here now it says the instance of entity type item cannot be tracked because another uh, instance with the same key value for ID is already being tracked. So notice here it tried to give it an ID of one, uh, and then it throws an exception. And I don't think that's correct behavior, I think this is still broken. Uh, it was broken in, what we're now running is 226, is that what I did? Yeah, 226, and it's it's still not working. So this repo did, did not do what I wanted it to do. Um, and I didn't think I should even have to do this reset value generator. So, so that's a problem. Um, let's stop debugging. And the issue is right here. Invalid operation key or ID column ID with value one is already being tracked. Um, let's add a couple other notes. This will fail in EF core two dot two dot six and Read O dot O uh, makes no difference if reset value generators is called. 
right? Make this call, run a test. It's red. Don't make the call, run a test. It's still red. Hopefully the test is actually running. It's just really fast. Yeah, so. All right, so I think this is still broken. I think I'm gonna push this repo out there. Let's do that. Uh, there. So, uh, just reasonably organized, yeah. Alright, so now I can link this to my original bug. Um, if I can find... Here it is. And I can say, what? Well, it's still failing. Alright, so this is marked as closed, but it still doesn't work. I could probably get the actual error message for. Mm -hmm. oh, that's interesting. That is different. Maybe, maybe. Okay, let's let's investigate this. That's not what I expected. Um, was it that line that failed? Let's, uh, let's debug it again. Alright, so here we go. Let's create this database. Let's add this item. Alright, where's our item? Right here. ID is 1. Save changes. Assert it's 1. Okay. Now we come down here. Item 2 has an ID of 2, which it shouldn't be. It should still be 1. Alright. So that fails. Okay. So on 224, alright, that's interesting. On 224 I get that, or 226 rather. So this will fail in... Alright, so if I'm not resetting the values, and I run it in 226, Feeling like I should have multiple tests for this. Let's make it more clear. Um, Alright, does this change anything if I take that out of there? Let's debug again. It's still running in 226. Come on, do it. Wait. It won't let me debug. because I'm still debugging, that's why. There we go, debug. Okay, so jump down here again. That works. You know, I said step over, why am I in here? set my breakpoint a little lower so I don't step through as much stuff. Let's go there. Right, debug. 
Alright, so item ID is 1. We got past that assert, so that worked. So let's step over that. Oh, I see it's blowing up. That's weird. Is this related 4096? Um, is that one of the ones I already have open? Is it this one? No. Is this one? No. That's the one I already have. I don't know. Let's click on your link. <clears throat> yes, that's related. Same same deal. And if we scroll down far enough on this, they're going to say check out 6872, which is the one I've got here. Right? Yeah, that's my initial one. So they all link back to my initial one. Um, please reopen it. It's a bug. Right. Yeah, here's me commenting on it. All right. Then other people agree, right? So this is what we're trying to see if they fixed. They, it was supposed to be fixed for 3.0. Okay, so let's uh, see. Why are we getting this? I'm able to cast object E of core in memory value generator internal in memory integer value generator to type resettable value generator. All right, so this just doesn't work in 226. So let's just make a note of that. Stop debugging. So we won't run that. And in 226, two, two, we get it's a 2. Right? And I don't know why this keeps fading in and out. I'm remoting into this machine. Um, and for some reason, it's being slow. All right. Let's go back to 3.0. Dot o dot o. Build that. Close that. Close that. Come back here. And all right. If we don't run DB context generator, then we're expecting an invalid operation exception here. Which I want to grab that error message so I can update the the bug. So let's debug into this. All right, we get here, we try and step, and it worked. What? Maybe it is fixed. What did I do wrong? Oh, it's still a two. Let me make sure I cleaned and I'm using the right assembly. Because it's behaving just like it did a second ago. Two two six. We clear the database, but it does not reset the ID. That is correct, Khaled. That's what we're seeing. So right now we're looking at item two. Its ID is zero. We add it to the collection. Bam! There we go. So I had to do a clean to get this to work. So let's uh, just print screen that. So I don't have to type it all out. Copy. Copy that. Come back into GitHub. Find my thing here. Get an invalid operation exception. Looks a lot like that. Um, okay. Saying the item is already being tracked. The good news is that the New entity's ID is one, as it should be, but for some reason, maybe the problem is on my end. Um, I think maybe I, this unsupported thing might be that I'm using the same DB context. In my test, I'm using the same DB context um, before and after calling ensure deleted maybe that's the unsupported scenario 
because the identity map in the DB context still has a reference to the now deleted entity from before I called ensure deleted. Okay, I think working, we'll say it's not working 100% for me. Um, Let's see if I've got a repo I can point them at with a certain commit number. All right, so let's stop this and let's do another git add dot git commit dash m uh, demonstrates 3.0 behavior when adding entity. Well, I'll just do that. Push. All right, I'm going to keep making changes to this. <clears throat> oh, thank you for following, Dennis. Um, so I want to be able to get a hyperlink to the specific commit that has the behavior that I want uh, Diego and the EF Core team to look at. So let's go back to my repo here. Let's refresh. And let's just go find... Where's the code, man? There, there we go. Let's go find my unit test one right there, and let's link to a specific commit. Can I do that right there? Um, history. That. No, oh, I don't want that. That's the commit. I want that. Browse the repository at this point. Yes. Okay, so there's my long URL that I want to say here. Repro is here. Boom. Comment. All right, now let's try doing what I think that they now support, which is having a couple of different tests in a couple of different places, clearing out the uh, EF core and verifying that things still work. Um, so let's try a different test, and let's give this a... Um, Give it a different name. We need to add another test, I think. So add a new class, and this will be um, separate entity. Uh, IDs work properly, maybe. Add that. Uh, make this public. Let's steal some code from over here for creating. Actually, let's just keep it simple. Let's just create this DB context. I think this could be its own class, its own file, and item can be in its own file, right? Okay. And I don't really care about these value generators. I'm not using those. But if I come in here, and we create a test, and we say public void, I'll come up with a name in a minute, var equals new app db context. And I probably still want to give it some options. Um, not that one. Create new context options. I think that's what I want. That's static. Let's put it in its own better named class. Public class get, let's see, um, say db config. Make this a static class. And just pull this out of there. Pull this into its own place, and then this becomes db config. Right, and then I can do the same thing. And why are you red? Inaccessible due to its protection level. Well, we can't have that. All right. So now over here, when I want to get that db context, it looks like that. All right. And I should be able to say, 
Put your effect. And when we do this, our database is going to be a new GUID, that new GUID every time, right? So in here, we're going to create bar item one equals new item. Name equals something. And then we'll add it. And we've already discovered that that actually changes the ID right there. So let's assert on that. Which is just weird. And then we don't even have to save changes. Um, to be context items dot. I should probably add the item there, huh? Item one. Okay, so let's verify this runs. Yep, that works. I still think that's weird, but that works. Okay, now the issue is if I delete that item and then I add it again from a different, totally different DB context. All right, let's go over here. Test two has another item, some other name, adds the item. We don't care what its thing is. We'll say db context.save changes this time. Um, and then we want to maybe add a couple more items. How do I do this? Where I've run into this before. Maybe this uh, this last link that uh, Khaled sent me, maybe it's got what I want. Maybe there's some sample code here. So here we go. So this person, show the failure. Get my database. Find me person who's wants to say, what does get my database do? And calls us and sure deleted and adds a couple people, Zach and George. All right. So then. Will you be doing a video using Cosmos and EF Core? Um, not today. Maybe at some point. Okay. Shoes on 333. Alright, so Zach1 is give me first or default where ID is 1. Should be Zach. Okay, that works. DB2, give me first or default. And now. DB is on three and four. Okay, I can do that. That'll work. So let's uh, let me just change people to items. Let's just steal this code and see what it does. Um, over here, and I like this code better than my code. So let's get rid of that. Let's add that. Get my DB needs to be in app DB context. Options Builder. Uh, I can use my options that I'm using. So let's DB config there. I don't need that. I've already got that, I believe. DB equals new whatever with that. Right. This is app. Context. Okay. Sure. Deleted. Everywhere we see people, it's items. Everywhere we see person, it's item. This fuzziness is annoying me. I didn't have that previously. Not sure why it's doing that today. CPU's not busy. How about the other machine? Oh, 
Nope, that's the wrong one. It's hard to get to my taskbar on the other machine. Oh well. I apologize for the uh, fuzziness on the screen occasionally. Not sure why it's being slow to repaint. I'm sure it's something to do with my machine's capabilities at the moment. Alright, so I don't need... I don't think I need that test. That's not really doing anything. Um, well, here's my show failure one. We're going to get the DB twice. We're going to delete it in between and add these same two records without specifying the IDs and both times they should be the same. Alright? Should be one and two. So if we run this test does it now work in 3.0? And it does, doesn't it? So that's good. All right, so show failure. We'll say in 2, what's it in pre 3.0 EF core. Okay, so let's, let's verify this. 2.2.6. Save that. Clean. Seem to be required. And then rebuild and come back to this one and run it again. It still works. That doesn't make sense. Unless it was fixed prior to 226, but I don't think it was. So, did my build clean that work? Mm -hmm. core two two six update to just go to two two zero and see what that does. Update accept and build clean build rebuild. Try and run it now. Still works. That's weird. How old is that issue? This issue is from 2015. Alright, so maybe it was fixed a while ago. Originally they claimed it was by design, which is crazy. And when did this maybe get fixed? Uh, yeah, as of January of 2018, it was still a bug. I don't know why it's working all of a sudden for me here. Um, mm -hmm. Maybe they fixed it into something. Let's try... You have core memory. Let's try something even earlier. Right. 1.1.6. Probably have stuff that doesn't even compile if I go that far back. But we'll see. Okay, build clean. Well, I'm doing something stupid and then this test is not doing what I think it is. In which case, please tell me. Alright, so let's go back here. Let's run this test. <laughs> it thinks it still works. Yeah, there's something wrong here. There's no way that should be working. So the other one still fails, but this one passes. That is odd. Options he's using. Well, so am I. I did change his code, so maybe I broke it when I changed it. I can try and answer a Blazor question. Zelucient. Zelucient. 
So I'm using using memory to. Oh, that GUID thing wasn't there. Yeah, that name was optional back in the day when this would have been first written. Um, so that's a good point. So let me let me let me roll back a little bit to what his thing was actually testing before I mucked with it. So when he did his thing, he had a, just a new options builder and that. And I, of course, was smart and said, hey, let me just share my code that's using this other thing. So, options builder, options builder, and then he news up his database. So yeah, probably the reason that's not working is because we're testing different things. Use that. We can still use FTB context, that should be okay. Alright, and look, he even told me this is the magic line that I then so quickly deleted. Okay, so let's build that. Let's see what this does. Okay, now it fails. That's that's what we would expect. And it fails probably right there. Uh, let's do this. Let's pin it. You have core, this, to this, assert not null, failure. Alright, so now let's get that NuGet version back to somewhere close to reasonable. Um, let's try 226, update to that. Thanks Khaled for helping me out on that. I was being an idiot. Um, da, 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 da. What does that say? It's obsolete, right, I know. We're gonna clean, we're gonna build. We're gonna run this test again and see if it still fails in 226. It fails in 226, all right. So the next question is, does it fail all the way up to 3.0? Latest stable, do it. Um, just to be safe, we'll clean, we'll build. I'm not ignoring you, Z Lucient. Actually I am, but I'm not ignoring you forever. I'll get to you in a sec. All right, so now let's fix this to a single uh, fixed value. So it'll be the same each time and see what that does. Uh, so let's run the test. And it works. That's nice. Uh, so even if it's the same database, they fixed it. So that's nice. Uh, da -da -da -da. Okay, so that's cool. So let's commit this. So, am I in the right place? Right there, that's my root, right? Yeah. That doesn't work. Oh well. PowerShell, I wish you were Unix. And all things. Um, demonstrating key reset fix in 3.0. Alright, now I should reference the bug that that's from. So that's this 4096 for that one. So, we'll just add a comment here. That. And I don't need this anymore. This is being really slow. There we go. And then let's reference my 4096 bug for the other one here, or 6872 rather. And we'll go back to this unit test one. My volume is low, well, I'm talking quietly. Um, let's see, my headset mic, I can boost that, is that a little better? Test, test, hopefully that's better. Um, much better. All right, that was going from like 85 to 90 on the gain, but sometimes that little bit makes a big difference. All right, so let me just finish, uh, get over to here, and what was I doing? I was going to add this for reference, and what did I do? Git add dot, git commit dash n, 
cleaning up and adding reference URLs. There's that. Okay. Now let's talk about your question. I started a new Blazor app, created a model, scaffolded it for CRUD, I created Razor pages, and I was wondering if I needed to create a new layout for Bootstrap. Or can I tie it into the dot razor main layout? I really don't know. Uh, let's let's play with that. Um, I think I think I've done what I wanted to do with EF Core. Now, before I jump into Blazor stuff, let me uh, let me pull up one other thing. So there was an issue in uh, I guess it's my DDD guestbook. So this is a lab that I do uh, when I do workshops on ASP.NET Core and clean architecture and DDD. Um, and so if we look at the, this is pretty much the current code, if we look at some of the code that we end up with in the controller, if I remember right here, this one, we have some pretty wonky code, like right here. And the reason why is because when we call repository update guestbook, we, we add this entry and we save it. Uh, we can't just keep the entries on there. We have to clear the entries out and then re-add them because of some weirdness that we were seeing with how in-memory database worked. Um, so I want to revisit this when I update to 3.0 and see if I can get rid of that ugliness because I think we should be able to. I think we can avoid needing that. All right, but your question is, um, let me make sure I'm on the latest Visual Studio, because I may not be on this machine. Your question is Blazor. Um, so let's play with that. So, do, do, I might need, I might need this. I was last updated 923, that should be all right, right? I'm not going to waste time re-updating it unless I have to, so let's see if, if we're good. So let's create a new project. Um, ASP.NET Core Web App, C Sharp, wait a second, hold on, Blazor App, that's what I want, right? Let's create a Blazor App. It used to be under ASP.NET Core Web App, but then not in the release version. So Blazor App, um, no I don't want to put it in that same spot. Let's put it in Dev Scratch. That sounds good. Blazor App 2. That works. Okay. Now, is it server or what? I'm assuming it's server. Solution, you created a Blazor server app just to make sure I'm making the same thing you are? I'm going to assume yes. Let's do that. You did server, thank you. Okay, so let's come into here and let's see what your uh, question is. Let's see if I can run this. It's thinking about it. I can close this. Probably can close that. Sure. Yes. All right, there we go. Hello world. Counter works. Weather data works. Okay, so let's talk about your question. So concepts I did, create a data model, scaffold it with Razor CRUD, the formatting wouldn't adopt the main layout format. Um, I don't know that I've tried to do that. So create a data model. What was your data model? We should have a layout, shouldn't we? There's our main layout, that Razor. And you're wondering if you needed a new underscore layout for Bootstrap. Or you're using bootstrap here comes with it okay and main layout razor has layout component base nav menu 
Where's the actual HTML header for this thing? No. Here. So there's that. So underscore host is the shared file that has the header information, really the whole layout. Not necessarily main layout. Main layout sits inside of host, it looks like. Alright, render component async for the app. Yeah. So everything everything that's Blazor sits inside here. And in the main layout uh, that razor is what you'll see there. So if I inspect the code, what I'm expecting I'll see is there should be body, app, and then div sidebar, right? So if we come in here and we right click and inspect something and we see body, app, sidebar, main. Does that answer your question at all? Because that looks right. So the difference is, right, you've got this part here is an actual razor page um, that, that has the main, you know, content, and this gets rendered down to the client, and then this uh, render component async app, which is running here in server pre-rendered because that's what's supported now, we don't have client yet, uh, for Blazor. This is this part that's everything that's inside this shell basically runs using Blazor. And I am not a Blazor expert, so I've I've played with it, I did a little bit of it on stream, but it's on my list to get better at. So Your question is how do I extend the host format to be into a new scaffolded razor page? Yeah, so I don't think Blazor has scaffolding, does it? So like you scaffolded, you said add new scaffolded item, and you said give me crud for something, right? Give me a razor page with entity framework crud, something like that, I'm guessing. Yeah? So let's let's create some data. Let's go and say add a new class, and our new class will be uh, ships and ships have public int id get set and we'll say they have a public string uh, I don't know so what kind of ship they are like that and then maybe they have a pilot if it's an instance of a ship maybe it has a pilot pilot get set, and we'll say control dot, generate some type called pilot, come over here, and these guys also have prop int id, and prop string name, All right, so there we've got some data, um, let's generate some data for working with pilots first. So we want a new scaffolded item, we want a razor page with crud, we're going to add that. Our model class is pilot, pilot, and our data context, I don't think we have one yet, do we? So we're going to add one, and we'll call it just app db context because it's my standard. Um, use a layout page, uh, leave this empty if you're setting a razor view file. I don't see a razor view start file, so I'm assuming it's not set there. So your question is, how do I set a layout page for this when we don't have one, right? Uh, and yeah, you're right, we don't have one. Um, I don't think these are designed to work with Blazor yet, I think is the short answer. So let's leave that empty and see what happens, and it's going to be ugly, is what, what the answer is going to be. So let's add it. It's going to scaffold up our code, and if I go to slash pilots, it should let me add and remove pilots, assuming that it adds the, the DB context for me correctly. Yeah, Blazor's new, so I'd be very surprised if they have working 
scaffolding for Blazer. Again, I haven't played with it that much. Okay. So that did its thing, or is doing its thing. Right, and you want to just reference underscore host, which you probably could do. And you could certainly do that after the fact, right? You could do what it said, which is add a view start, uh, or whatever that was called, view imports. Um, and then specify underscore host as the layout in there. Right, so here's imports.razor. Nope, that's not what we want. Let's go to startup. Let's see what it did with our EF DB context. So there it is. There's our app DB context. It even wants to use SQL Server. That's interesting. Uh, is it going to use a local DB? It is. All right, well, let's see if this thing works. Probably should. Bing, bing, boom. Unhandled. Request match multiple endpoints. Index and host. All right. What did you do? Uh, code generator. You broke my page. Oh, oh, I see. That was probably my fault. It dropped all the stuff right into the root, which I really wanted that to be in a subfolder. So we'll add a new folder. Call that pilots and create and delete and details and edit and index. Should all really go in there. Uh, yeah, do that. Okay, so now I think this stuff was all here before, right? So let's try running it again. It works. That's great. Let's go to slash pilots doesn't work. Local DB is not supported on this platform. All right. That's a little weird. I have other things that work with local DB, but okay. Let's go here. Just use in memory. I don't know. It should prompt me to install the package I need, right? Man. that, run that, still with me, Lucian, and we'll say slash pages, there's nothing there, how strange, oh, idiot, slash pilots, there we go, create a new pilot, that should be a link, but it's not, Okay, that's not ideal. Why is that not a link? Create new. Oh, the index page is create new. That's weird. Um, where's the list page? For each item in model.pilot. What did you generate? Pilot equals context dot pilot dot to list async. All right. Goes to the create. That should link to the create page, but it's not working. Hmm. 
Hmm, that's interesting. It didn't even render that as an ESP page. That's what you were seeing as well. Yeah, it seems like code gen's broken here. Because that's an at page. And since that's an at page, this is a, uh, what's it called? Um, tag helper. And that tag helper should yank out the ASP dash page. It should never get rendered. So why is Razor Pages not working correctly here? Where did you set the layout? I did not set the layout. The default template uh, has this set with ASP page, with an app page with a route right there. Uh, the tag helper is not included. That's what the issue is. I don't have. I don't have the standard shared stuff that adds the tag helpers. So this thing is expecting. All right, let's just do this. Let's create a new instance of uh, a new web app with Razor Pages. So I'm create a new project, and I'm going to steal the uh, shared view stuff. So there's this, there's that, there's that. It's all fine. This time we're going to do a standard web app, which is going to use Razor Pages. We'll create that. And I'm going to steal the view imports that we need. So in here, there's a view imports and a view start. View start has the layout. View imports has the tag helpers. So I want both of those. So I'm going to uh, just add those files to, I guess, the root of this. All right. So can we add a new, add a new item? So if you input your yeah, CSHTML. With an underscore. There's that using web application. Let's call this laser app two. It'll be better. All right, so this will get used by everything and that should fix the first problem. Hey, Crows 4K, thank you. Oh, subscription, awesome. Thank you, man. Uh, Khaled, where'd you set the layout? We weren't setting the layout, that's what we're doing now. I think I already mentioned that one. So if you start, it's the other one, that's where we're gonna set the layout. So let's just copy that. Like that. In here, copy that, paste it here, but we want to use underscore host, right? All right, now it's a little weird that this underscore host actually is itself a page because usually underscore denotes something that isn't an actual page, right? It's an include or it's a view import or a view start, so it's, it's a little strange to me that they named it that way in the template. I'm sure they had a good reason. So let's run this again. Now Razor Pages should work correctly, except I'm seeing a stack trace here, which is not good. Not supported. Specified method is not supported. What specified method? Hmm. Let's. I don't know why you're trying to run in Docker. Let's run there. Okay. Ensure rendered body or sections. It's not supported. Why are you calling it? Alright, so endpoint host really doesn't like the fact that we added a view start and a view in imports. One or the other of those things it doesn't like. So let's see which one it is. Uh, view imports. If we just do control C on that. Rebuild. And run it again. Still doesn't like it. So is it the layout? Undo. You start sets the layout to be host. Ooh, that might be a problem because if host is itself using host as a layout, that could be bad. 
So I probably need to override the layout. All right, let's assume that's the problem. And rather than assuming, let's just comment that out. I think I've narrowed it down. So host can't itself have host as its layout file. That would be a problem. Um, run it again. Hey, and everything works. Okay. Now, let's shut this down. Let's... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Fill some browser instances. <clears throat> Undo that, save it, and take that, go over to host, tell it you don't have a layout. And run it one more time. Now it works fine. All right, now let's go look at pilots. <clears throat> model item passed. This is a model item of type pages host. Really? What does host have to do with anything at this point? Invalid operation. All right, so we should be hitting index page okay see Lucian I got I got caught up to where you are all right so let's let's debug this so we're in pilots we're hitting index it looks like this um, there's an app DB context somehow pilots thinks it knows something about underscore host which it shouldn't. I don't even think I need that anymore because it should be inheriting that. I think the namespace should be inherited too. View imports namespace. Well, that's not the right namespace. All right, let's see if that namespace issue is my issue. Maybe that's it. Um, all right, so let's go here. We should be doing namespace. I think both of those I could pull out of there and paste into imports, All right? Save that, build. Let's see if the home page works. Home page still works, that's good. Now let's see if pilots works. No. View dictionaries of type, blah, 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 index model. Blazor app 2 dot, oh. Yeah, um, okay, let's see, there, there, pages dot pilots, does that matter? Type or namespace, index model does not exist in blazer app 2 dot pages, okay model pages dot pilots try that so i wonder if that index model was getting somewhere else i was trying to pick it up from somewhere else because i moved it into a subfolder crows 4k is it correct order by nullable date dot by nullable data order descending purchase date or date time dot min value order by descending you're saying if the purchase date is null, then it should be, well, it depends. Where do you want that purchase date to be? At the top or the bottom of your list? Um, code stencil, hello. What did you miss? Uh, we wrote some tests for EF Core to demonstrate some fixes they did for 3.0. And then uh, folks started asking me Blazor questions, so we shifted into that. And now we're trying to get some and still EF Core related, I guess. We're trying to get some um, EF Core scaffolded CRUD stuff to work with Blazor. So currently, we're trying to get it to work with Razor Pages inside of Blazor Host, and that's not working because this thing requires a model item of type Blazor App Two dot Pages dot Pages under under Host, which doesn't make any sense. 
Where are you getting that from? You must be somehow referencing host. Which I don't know how that is. Top late's top latest date. Right, yeah, that's let me get that crows for you. Um your question is just whether or not you want to use min value versus max value? Is that the question? Because pick one, and then if it doesn't work, pick the other. Like, this is one you could just trial and error. Unless this is like an interview question and I need to get it right to get the job, in which case I'd run a test. But it really just depends on where you think no date goes when you're sorting by date. And that's arbitrary, right? If they if they never purchased it, then does that mean that they purchased it in the future? Or does that mean that they're never going to purchase it and it should go at the bottom? It's up to you. Check this for layout in Blazor. Yeah, I saw you sent that early, Kel. Let's, let's check that. Um, I'm not trying to use Blazor at the moment, just to be clear. I'm trying to use a Razor page in a page that happens to also use Blazor, so... But let's look at Blazor layouts. <laughs> Alright, so we have layout component base. Add a bunch of stuff. We have a default layout. Which you specify in the app.razor file. Do I have one of those? I think I do. There's my app.razor file. It's got layout, type of main layout. Okay, it's got a router. Route data, main layout. Here's our main layout. We already looked at this. It just has that sidebar and that data. We could use different layouts for different Blazor endpoints. So you can specify a layout in your component if you need to. You can put stuff in a centralized location. You can nest them. Okay, that's all good stuff. Um, it does not tell me why this page should work all by itself. It uses that thing. It should use view imports. So it should have that namespace. And I could add a namespace for itself if I needed to, which I don't think I do, but let's let's add also dot pilots. Okay. Oh, that's a problem. Sorry, I totally forgot that I had that. Uh, I thought I wanted to have a default layout. No, I didn't. No, sorry, I wanted it to be host. It was, that was the original intent. Okay. Alright, so that's how it's getting it. Fine. Understand. So let's look at host. And host then tries to set the layout to empty. Yeah, see this is just wonky that host host shouldn't be a layout. Host should not host should just be a page. So here's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna say control C, control V. This one is my layout. And this one is my host. And guess what, host? You're just a page, so you don't get an underscore. That's how I would define you. So host has no layout, but everybody else is going to use layout. Layout doesn't have a route, because it's a layout. It doesn't have that. I don't remember if it needs an app page. We'll leave that for now. Uh, actually, we can check it. Let's go check this other example here. It's going to have a layout, and I don't think it needs a page. No, it doesn't. Alright, so page goes away. So now we've got some duplicated code, but that's okay. Because Razor pages are different. And instead of having that render blazer, we want it to render body. So this right here, instead of being an app, should just be a body without that. And uh, Lucian, this probably isn't helping you so much at this point. It's just showing really how to do Razor pages side by side with Blazor. Because what I think you want is how to generate actual Blazor crud, uh, and we're not quite there yet. So that fails because 
page the route value slash underscore host. I don't know where that's defined, but I don't care too much yet. Let's get the razor pages working, um, which I think I can do now. So hang on, we'll ignore that error and go to pilots. And I still fail. All right, fine. Kill this. Kill here. Let's do a control shift F for underscore host because somebody hard coded that thing somewhere. And there it is. View start. View stone. I thought I changed that. Layout equals layout. And does it need the CSH2? It doesn't need that. Okay. Where else? Startup. Fall back to page. Map. Fall back to page. Host. All right. Bam. That works again. Yay. All right. And pilots. Works. We can create a new pilot. No, we can't. Uh, we're so close though. Invalid operation, da, 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 pages layout, scripts, to ignore an unrendered section, call ignore section, section new. Copy this end section here. Come over here, go to my layout, and put it right there. Okay, so now we're to try this one more time. There we go. Really, I just wanted an opportunity to put in some pilots so you all knew what kind of ships I was talking about. Because otherwise you could have thought I was talking about naval ships. But no, these were supposed to be Star Wars ships with Star Wars pilots. All right, so there we go. We got some scaffolding to work side by side with a Blazor app. And that was painful, but they can work side by side. Should probably be a little less painful with the default scaffolding. Um, I would I would definitely agree with you if you were saying that. As far as scaffolding actual blazer stuff, I'm sure that's coming, but I don't think it's there yet. Okay, uh, Ace Flame Seer. Anyone in the chat knows there a way to get the iApplication Builder interface in a class library in 3.0 without referencing the older 2.2 package? Project SDK has it. Class library uses the net SDK, which doesn't have it, so I'm forced to reference the 2.2 library the older way. I don't know. What are you trying to do with application builder in the class library for one thing? Usually I only ever use that in, in an entry point, in an ASP.NET Core app or a console app, maybe a service, service host. Um, but I suppose if you were trying to do like an extension method or something for a component, you might want to have an application builder. Extensions for specific DI, yeah, okay, that's what I figured. And in 2.2, you would reference the regular SDK, and now you can't. I haven't run into that. Um, yeah, I'm not sure. I could probably repro what you're seeing, um, but I don't know that that would help you. Okay, let's, uh, let's figure out what we're going to do with the rest of our time here. Anybody else have any questions? I heard some of you say you saw my talk on Wednesday for .NET Conf, talking about eShop on web. Um, yep, yeah, Ace Flame. Uh, if you post it real quick, uh, I'll, I'll tweet about it and get some more eyes on it for you. If you have Twitter, just uh, just mention me, at Ardellis. And I'll, I'll retweet your Stack Overflow question. Because um, I don't know if you can post the URL. So I guess you can. Kyle will just post the URL. Yeah, so or if you want, just post the URL to Stack Overflow here in the chat. We'll get some people to to share it. All right, so here's the, the project that I went over on Wednesday in very short order. Uh, and I said if, if anybody had more questions, you wanted to go through it at a more reasonable pace, um, 
that I could talk about it on my stream sometime. So here I am. Anybody have any questions? I think I still have the thing open. No, I don't. I closed it. Um, but I could open it again. <clears throat> um, let me look at some of the issues that are here, by the way. Talk about some of the stuff that's going to be coming. So, uh, admin page to add content and manage content uh, is on the on the list of, of things to add. So, um, I think that would be a nice addition. And so let's let's bring it up. You shop on web. Let's run it. And I think it's using an in-memory database uh, by default in uh, localhost debug mode. But here's the, the page. Now there's actually a bug that got introduced at some point that it, uh, I haven't managed to track down. So if any of you want some extra credit points here for open source contribution, check this out. All right, if I log in, demo user, log in, now I'm demo user. Add this to my basket. Check out. Thanks for your order. Go over here. Look at my orders. Look, there it is. Okay. Now, let's log out. Let's add this item to my basket. Let's check out. It's going to ask me if I want to log in. All right, let's log in. Let's go look at my orders. It's not there. It's supposed to be there. All right. It used to work. When I first created this app, this thing worked. So what's supposed to happen there is... When you check out, you go to basket, check out. There's an on post handler here. And on post, it, uh, what does it do? Here. Set basket model async has this if statement that says, hey, if you're signed in, we're going to go ahead and fetch your basket and then do stuff. But if you're not signed in, you're going to hit this else statement. And it's going to say get or set basket cookie and username, which used to work. And it's going to say go fetch that thing out of your cookie. Uh, and if your username is, I don't know, here. <clears throat> it, it creates um, this cookie the first time. As a, as a GUID for your username, right? And then in here there was some code. Thanks for the follow, Gab Poker CC. I appreciate it. In here there was some code that would basically transfer from a random username from an anonymous user as you're building up your basket anonymously uh, to whoever you were after you logged in, right? So I wonder if that happened when. I'm trying to think. We used to have our own account management. TBD Gamer, thank you, man. Uh, or don't want to assume gender. Uh, thank, thank you. Anyway, as I was saying, we used to have some code, I think, on login that would do the check. And maybe that's what happened. Is we had a login page that was in a separate account controller back in the day. Uh, and when we switched over to using... The, uh, the separate NuGet package for identity. Uh, initially, I don't think we even had scaffolded these login pages, but now we've got a scaffolded login. And I think when you log in, there was some logic that was supposed to do something with that cookie and transfer the basket owner. And maybe that got lost in the shuffle. Let's see. You log in. Right, I don't see anything in here that's messing around with that cookie with that basket. So maybe that's the issue. Maybe it had to happen at login time. But anyway, that's a that's a bug that should be fixed. Um, I don't know if there's still an issue out there for it, but there used to be. There's only 10 issues. This is all of them. Yeah, I don't think I have an issue tracking that. 
Alright, anybody have any questions about eShop on web? The other thing that I showed on Wednesday... Alright, here we go. Khalid wants to know, how do you convert your clean architecture project to support multi-tenant? Someone asked that on Wednesday, too, a similar question. Um, multi-tenant has a few different options for how you want to do it. And they all have pros and cons, so it really depends on what architecture you want to support. So let's just uh, open up Notepad for a second and talk about multi-tenant. So multi-tenant options. One, copy the app and the database for every customer. This actually works pretty well when you only have a small number of customers, and especially if your customers are such that they're expecting a lot of customization, right? In the short term, it's easier to do it this way, all right? Second one, you want to do a single database with a tenant key. Fine, let's talk about that. So you have a single app, single DB, separate tenant ID per customer tenant, right? This one uh, is nice from the perspective that, you know, you only have to have one system to update, it's not nearly as nice when you want to customize things for a, a specific tenant you know, that wants their thing to look different or act different than everybody else. Um, but for, for most things, this works fine, right? So if you're talking about, you know, you've got a, a site that wants to support a whole bunch of different blogs and you let people use uh, whatever their company name is for, you know, white, la uh, white labeling your site to be their blog site, right? And maybe they can pick different themes, but, you know, as far as they're concerned, it looks like their company's blog, um, even though it's just a, a different tenant ID in your system that's actually hosting a bunch of these. Okay, so there's a feature. Uh, one option here is there's a feature in EF that helps with this. Um, and I can't remember the name of it off the top of my head. It's something default to filter or something like that. Um, but EF has a feature that you can add. Feature... Add to DB context a default filter that applies to every single query that it makes. And you can use that for multi-tenancy, and that was one of the design purposes of that feature. And that feature was called, somebody know? Anybody know? Uh, EF core default filter that. What's this thing? Global query filters. That's what it was. Um, so for multi-tenancy, you can define a tenant ID. So, Khaled, are you familiar with global query filters? If you're not, this would be a good place to start looking. There's actually a sample on GitHub that shows how this works. This is from 2017, so it's probably 2.0. Yep, there it is, introduced in 2.0. Okay, so you are familiar with this. All right. So if you configure this and you say that we have a global query filter on tenant ID, then it's going to use that tenant ID on uh, every every request. Provided that the the uh, modeling question has a field called tenant ID. Uh, you can make requests if you want by saying ignore query filters when when you don't want to to use them, but otherwise they are done every time. So that's um, that's one option. Right, there's that. Okay. Um, how to convert clean architecture to support? So, what would I do to to convert clean architecture with this? Uh, you could add tenant ID to base entity. Yes, exactly. Because basically, you have a composite key now. Um, so let's go to clean architecture. Just similar to eShop on web. This is basically a solution template. You come in here, and in core, I've got this shared kernel folder that includes a base entity. And as you just said, your base entity could include tenant ID because all your entities are going to basically have a composite key of their tenant ID and their ID. Uh, it's also possible, or it's also likely, that uh, if you, for security purposes, if you don't want someone to be able to guess the IDs of other system entities, um, especially if you're exposing them in your URL, right, if your route includes this, uh, you might want your tenant IDs or your IDs to not be uh, just sequential integers. Uh, because if I know that my IDs are all, you know, starting at 
one dash one, then I could be like, hmm, I wonder what two dash one is. I wonder what three dash one is, and and see what other tenants uh, entities are for a given a type of entity. So again, depending on how you're exposing this in the UI uh, or in the API or whatever it is that your interface is, um, you might not want to use numeric uh, identity column integers for these. Okay, so if you had base entity with a tenant ID and then you use uh, global query querying filters, um, that should mostly do the trick for you. Now you're going to have some things that don't have a filter, right? Like you're going to have lookup data. Um, maybe you've got like a list of countries that you use on the address form that displays all the countries. Those don't vary by tenant, probably. Although I suppose they could if you've got, you know, maybe China want, doesn't want to see Hong Kong as a separate country, but everybody else does. You know, you could even have that be varying. Um, but but those you would use the uh, the option here to to ignore query filters. When you when you fetch those shared types of data, I was thinking to link the user to the tenant and then use the user to get the tenant ID. Um, depending on the kind of app, yeah, you can do that. Uh, more commonly, I think the uh, the tenant is coming from the route. Because the tenant's going to be based on the domain, regardless of who the user is. You know, like you might not even be logged in, depending on the type of app, right? Like if 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 I'm just going to a page and that page is a multi-tenant app um, for for different people publicly, then then you need to use the tenant ID is to be derived from the domain, the route, something like that. Maybe even a query string. Um, but yeah, if it's if it's each user is going to have a different experience, um, and you maybe have a bunch of users per tenant, then then your approach could make sense. Yeah, you let them log in. And then, based on who they are, they, they belong to a tenant. Now, what happens if the same user wants to belong to more than one tenant? Um, that, could be, that could be a challenge at that point, right? Then you have to have another screen where they pick which, which tenant they're logging in for. RGX attempts. Didn't know how to stream. I've been following his portal site courses. Hey, RGX. Thanks for the follow. Yeah, I've been on streaming for, I don't know, almost a year. I think I started last December. And all, this, all my stuff's on uh, YouTube. If you go to YouTube slash C slash Ardellis, it's on there too. I think if I mention YouTube, it shows up. YouTube? Maybe? It's supposed to. It's not working. Oh well. All right, Khaled. Uh, yeah, so hopefully that helps. Hopefully that answers your question. Um, if you wanted to tie the tenant ID to the route, you would just need a piece of middleware. And that middleware would look at some part of the route. It could be the subdomain, it could be a folder, it could be a query string, whatever it is. And probably that that subdomain or, or whatever is going to be a string, right? Like, you know, maybe you have uh, a bunch of different customers and, you know, they each have a different subdomain, right? So you've got like ardallis.foo.com and you've got microsoft.foo.com. So Ardallis and Microsoft are your two customers. So you map in your middleware, you would map our Dallas to tenant ID one and Microsoft to tenant ID two, right? And then from that point forward in, in the pipeline, you would know that that was the ID and you would use that for all your entity framework queries. We should have a lab about this with subdomains. Sure, uh, you know, it should be pretty straightforward. It's just, like I said, it'd be like three lines of middleware. Um, but yeah, that would be uh, an idea. So let me think, what would that lab be? Let's see, idea for future stream lab activity, uh, multi-tenant middleware for clean architecture, uh, allow mapping of different subdomains to different tenants. Uh, show a different version of the app based on subdomain. Something like that. How to test build if localhost 5000. Um, you would use probably a host file. Show how to how to test this when running on localhost 5000. 
how would subdomains work? All right. Thanks for following AMGDY. I don't know how to pronounce that. Yeah, so if you used your host file, um, you could just do notepad. You have to run it as administrator. Yes. All right, it's a alt F O C colon Windows dir system thirty two drivers. They put it in a very convenient place, it's easy to type. Hosts, I think. Nope. Uh did I miss one? Oh yeah, etc. Hosts open. Here we go. So Docker junk, right? So you would say um foo.localhost.com is localhost, right? And you do bar.localhost.com like that. Okay, and I save that. I can close this. I can come back here and let's run this one. Doesn't really matter which app we're running. Um, this is eShop on web. Mac doesn't support subdomains. Well, I don't know what to tell you about that, but we go to foo.localhost.com on whatever port, and yeah, the, the SSL is not going to work, but um, hmm, that didn't quite work, did it? I wonder if I did it not secure. Yeah, well, that's why it would be a lab. We play around with it. Um, not sure why that didn't work. Bad request, invalid host name. Localhost. I guess I didn't need the dot com. Maybe that was my problem. Oh well. It was going so well up until it didn't work. Notepad. Run as administrator. Wish this had uh, recent files, but it doesn't. But there's that. At least it remembered the right folder. I think I could just do food at localhost. Right. And then let's uh let's do a different let's open up that other project I just did. Recent projects. Uh web application one. Let's open that one. And let's see properties. Let's see what happens if we build it. Um, here, without HTTPS, so it's just going to run on 80, alright, no, I don't want to run Docker, let's run Project, um, Profile, Application 1, Project, there it is, localhost 5000, save it. Uh, come over here, go to web application one, run it. Should run on localhost 5000. There it is. Now, if I said it was foo.localhost, will that work? There we go, that works. All right, now if I say it's bar. It gets more complicated if you use uh, SSL, but there we go. Okay, so that, that would let you then pull this off in some middleware. And then after you've got that, you can just map it, right? Maybe you've got a table that says this subdomain matches this tenant ID. Does that make sense? So I'll, I'll throw this somewhere, not that, that. I'll throw this somewhere and keep it as an idea for a future um, stream thing. And we can do that as a, like you say, as a lab for clean architecture. It could be fun. All right. I'm about done for today. Um... Anybody have any any last questions, requests? Using .NET Framework can't go to .NET Standard 2.1, just needed for 3.0. Yeah, well, it, you're, for for legacy stuff that's that you have to keep supporting, it's not unusual that you're going to not be able to go directly to 3.0. But for new stuff, you can probably, you know, if I were you, I'd probably start it with 3.0. It does have a lot of fixes. All right, everybody. Have a good weekend. You have Pluralsight courses? I do, in fact. 
Uh, they mostly don't cover tech so much. They cover principles and patterns and stuff like that. So solid principles, how to do refactoring, how to write clean code, domain-driven design and clean architecture, that kind of stuff. Um, you know, none of my little widgets are working in the chat, are they? Because when you say plural site, it's supposed to like jump in and say, oh, here's my plural site stuff. But uh, if you say plural site in, say, Google, Steve Smith, like that, then I show up here and I have stuff like refactoring and solid and pair programming and domain driven design and more refactoring and Kanban and more solid and design pattern library. So, yeah, check them out. Um, I appreciate it. If you have any questions or if you need anything, let me know. Uh, I'm planning on doing a few more uh, design pattern courses here in the very near future. So, um, look for that as well. RGX attempts with the question. I have a question. Issue multi tenant using their own DBs, right? Having trouble instantiating my DB context using those DBs. That should just be a connection string. How would you resolve the connection strings for a runtime thing like that? On an individual request in your middleware, somewhere, somewhere early on in the request, you're going to figure out who this tenant should be. You're going to do that based on a query string, a header, a subdomain, a route. Somehow you're going to say maybe maybe even who the user is, right? You're going to say, okay, and I now know that this request goes with database A and not any of the other databases. All right, so then your connection string is normally you just pull it right out of app settings, right? I don't think this one's using a connection string, but maybe it is. Um, no, this one doesn't have a database. But normally you would have an app settings, and your app settings would have a connection string, and it would say, um, you know, what, what the database is. Let me go back to here and go back to here and here and here right so this says hey here's my database and in this case it says trusted connection equals true right but that that could be a format string so your database your connection string your default connection in the uh, database could say blah 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 and then right here that could be you know curly braces zero and then when you go to actually create your connection you could say string dot format connection string comma and then here's the actual name of the database I want to talk to. All right, and that would be the simplest way to, to do it, right? Um, and it would just, you know, substitute in whatever database name you were using. Does that make sense? Because your AppDB context, when you go to create it, uh, can have a, a connection string passed in. Now, if you're not creating it yourself and you're just letting... Uh, the framework do it. You're just doing something like this: options dot use SQL Server get connection string blah blah blah. Um, you would want to do something. You would want to have some kind of code that executed here that would figure out what that code was, what the what the current database name or tenant name was. Um, and so you'd you'd have something in here that would be a, a callback or a or dynamic that would do it. Using composition rate program CS, which doesn't know anything at the start of the app, right? But I managed to get a delayed load, but I don't like my solution. Uh, I would need to see it. You know, post it on uh, Stack Overflow or something. And you don't like it because it's slow? It's ugly? It's. I mean, is it. You say it's. It sounds like you're saying it's working, but I don't know why you don't like it. So I would need more information. By the way, I also do consulting for a living, so you know, you could hire me. Um, but yeah, for quick uh, advice and tips while I'm streaming, I'm happy to, to give you ideas. But the key thing, which I think you've already figured out, is that what you know here, whether it's a program CS or app startup, um, is not the same as what you know at runtime when it's actually in the middle of a request. And so what you need is for this to not be a static thing that runs one time when the app starts, but rather to have a callback in there that you will know when it makes that callback, you'll know some more information at runtime and you'll be able to insert the, the correct value at that time. If the requests are in the wrong order, it doesn't work. Okay. Yeah, I'm not sure I can help you with that with what uh, information we have at this point. Plus, I'm over time. So I've got to get to some other things. So thanks, 
have a good weekend. Um, feel free to hit me up next week on stream. And um, if you have some code you can share on GitHub or something, you know, take a minimal sample of what you're trying to do. I don't mind pulling it down and taking a look at it. All right. Um, you know what? Let's see who's online that we can we can raid. So twitch.tv. Oh wait, we have a live coders live coders .dev, uh, that I just found out about the aliases to this. So Ed is still running. He's going long today. Let's go raid Ed. He's probably going to be done any any second now, but that's okay. So go to my Twitch. Go to my that's me. Uh, creator dashboard. I think this is it. Yeah, let me go over here. We can say, pick a channel. There's Ed. Raid Ed. And you guys can go learn some more about Blazor from someone that actually knows what they're doing. Uh, and wait for it. There we go. So thanks. Have a good weekend. Talk to you guys later.